Hello, in this video we're going to solve some problems in engineering and science using matrices. And our first example here is relating to nutritional content in two popular breakfast cereals. We've got the calories, protein, carbohydrates, and fat, fat per serving of Cheerios and 100% natural cereal on the left and right here. And we want to make a combination of these two cereals that gives us 295 calories, 9 grams of protein, 48 grams of carbohydrate, and 8 grams of fat. So the first thing we're going to do is set up a vector equation. And we're going to do that by calling our amount of cereal number 1, x1. And that's going to give us, again, 110 calories, 4 grams of protein, 20 grams of carbohydrates, and 8, 2 grams of fat. And then we're going to add to that some amount of the second cereal. And the nutritional facts for that are 130 calories, 3 grams of protein, 18 carbohydrate, and 5 grams of fat. And then the sum of those two together is going to equal exactly our desired amount, 295 calories, 9 grams of protein, 48 grams of carbohydrates, and 8 grams of fat. And so if you've been paying attention through the last several videos, what I've been doing is making matrices with these systems of linear equations and then solving them with technology. Again, technology is helping people in the real world solve problems faster and more reliably. And although we need to learn how to do some of these things for test day and in our homework and math classes, uh, again, as I've said more than once, the tedious and repetitive nature of some of these mathematical techniques most certainly turns some people off to mathematics. And while we need specialists to, say, write a computer program like GeoGebra, uh, which will be able to uh, put these matrices into road-reduced echelon form very quickly and reliably, we also need to recognize that the average person doesn't need to be able to do all that. Uh, and so uh, it is much more efficient and effective to just go straight to the techniques, 1.5 servings, uh, let the technology do it for us. So we want to make 1.5 servings of the first cereal, that's Cheerios, and our second cereal gets one serving. And that will give us exactly the macronutrients and number of calories that we're looking for. Again, using technology to solve these problems much faster. And, of course, some people have a natural talent or interest in doing all of the long-form work, and we need those people. Uh, it's just that the majority don't have such interests or talents. Uh, we can generally learn how to do these things. Um, but as the processes become more difficult and as you get into eigenvectors and eigenvalues and diagonalization of matrices, these are extremely complex tasks uh, that fewer and fewer people can and will do. And so being able to uh, rest and rely on the technology is really important too. In our second example, the Cambridge diet supplies 0.8 grams of calcium per day in addition to the nutrients in Table 1. Here's Table 1. We've got protein, carbohydrate, and fat from three different sources, non-fat milk, soy flour, and whey. And then the amounts of calcium per unit, 100 grams supplied by the three ingredients, are as followed, 1.26 grams. We're looking at calcium, and we're going to add a fourth ingredient to the mixture, soy protein which provides 80 grams of protein, 0 grams of carbohydrate, 3.4 grams of fat, and 0.18 grams of calcium. We want to set up a matrix whose solution determines the amount of non-fat milk, soy flour, whey, and isolated soy protein necessary to supply the precise amounts of protein, carbohydrate, fat, and calcium in the Cambridge diet. State the variables in the equation and then solve and discuss these things. So we've got protein carbohydrates, fat, and calcium. And then we've also got uh, non-fat milk. We've got soy flour. We've got whey protein or whey. And we've got soy protein. 
here and so we're just going to fill in these values 30 again 36 this is coming directly from the table 36 52 0 and then remember calcium from uh, calcium from non-fat milk is right here 1.26 grams that's the additional new value from our question here 1.26 and then continue filling in values from that table 51 34 7 and then our next one for soy flour we're looking at 0.19 grams of calcium from whey we've got 13 74 1.1 and calcium from whey looks like 0 0.8 0.8 and finally from soy protein 80 grams of protein zero carbohydrates 3.4 grams of fat and 0.18 grams of calcium and so all of that is going to equal This same amount here, 33, 45, 3, and our last one here is given 0.8. Oh, where did it go? 0.8 grams from whey. Thirty-three, forty-five, three, point eight. All right, so we're going to solve that equation there. And again, we're just going to put it right in the GeoGebra. And it gives us our answer. And so what it's saying is we should have 0.64 servings. 0.64 servings or units of the first valuable variable which means uh, along this axis we're going to have milk right so non-fat milk and then followed by soy flour but then we have negative values here we've got negative 0 0.09 and negative 0 0.21 and so we can't have negative servings so this is impossible. So we can't get this exact amount of macronutrients and calories uh, from these, this combination of ingredients. And so this application or this, this desired result from the Cambridge diet is in fact impossible. Right? Maybe that seems like kind of a silly example to you. Here's a more more of a real-world example for those of you who are getting into circuits and electrical engineering you will see many 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 of these in your freshman engineering classes and so between matrices and technology these become really easy now when I was a freshman electrical engineering student we had to do these by hand using algebra and they can become relatively confusing. This is a fairly simple circuit. We've got current flowing in a counterclockwise direction in each of these parts of the circuit or each of these sub-circuits. We've got resistors here. We've got a battery. Now the battery, the voltage is going to flow from this shorter, thicker pole here, which is the negative, to the longer, uh, thinner pole, which is positive go through several resistors. We know that voltage is equal to current times resistance. And so here we know that, let's look at our first loop. We know that one IR or one I1, sorry, plus, so one I1 plus five I1 plus four I1 plus one I1 equals 11 I1, right? So again, I times R, the current times the resistance. If the current is I here, I1 going around in this loop, then in order to find the voltage around the entire loop, we need to add, we need to multiply all of the currents by all the different resistors. And so let's look at small R1. I'm gonna put it in a vector 
format here, we've got 11, right? So we've basically we're adding up the value of ohms across all those resistors. We've got 1 plus 5 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 1 is 11. Easy enough. Now this is going counterclockwise here, and this is also going counterclockwise, and so as this current is flowing, it's going to be opposed by this current across this resistor, and so we want to subtract 5 because this current flowing right to left across the resistor, I2 flowing right to left, is going to subtract from the current flowing left to right across that same resistor from the first loop. And then the first loop and the third loop and first and fourth do not touch. And so that's what we get for R1. Now R2, again, we're just going to add up all of the different, we're going to add up the resistances across the different resistors. In loop number two, we're going to subtract from that the um, resistances or the, the ohm values uh, across the resistors shared with I1 and I3 when I1 and I3 are going in opposite directions. So let's look at loop number two first. 3 plus 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus 5 is 10. And so for this part we can write 10. Now remember I1 and I2 share one resistor and those currents are going in different directions. So we're going to subtract 5 there. I2 and I3 share one resistor and again they are going in opposite directions. Loop number two is crossing this resistor from left to right, loop number three, current is crossing from right to left. And so we're going to put a number negative one there for uh, the place of I3, R3. Same thing, four plus two is six, plus two is eight, plus one is nine. So for loop three, we're going to put nine. I3 and I1 are not touching. I3 and I2 share one resistor, so we're going to get a negative one there. I3 and I4 share one, so we're going to put a negative 2 here. And finally, R4. Well, R4 doesn't touch R1 or R2. We've got 2 plus 1 is 3, plus 4 is 7, plus 3 is 10. So down at the bottom, we're going to put 10. And then I4 and I3 share one resistor, so we'll put a negative 2 there, because again, those currents are going in opposite directions. And so in order to solve this problem, we've got R1, R2, R3, R4. And this is equal to, let's put all these together. Equal to that matrix there. And then we've got our I matrix is equal to I1, I2, I3, I4. And again, R times I equals V. And so we're going to take that R matrix, 11 minus 5, 0, 0, negative 5, 10, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 9, negative 2, 0, 0, negative 2, 10. And we're going to multiply that by the current matrix, I1, I2, I3, I4. And that's equal to our voltages. Now our voltages are found by looking at the batteries. Remember we're moving from the shorter, thicker one to the longer, narrower one, uh, going counterclockwise here. So since our current is going from the negative to the positive, then we'll have uh, 20, again, plus 30. 20 plus 30 is 20 plus 30 is 50. And then in our loop number two, we're moving from the, we're moving the opposite direction, going from the long skinny one to the short fat one. And so we're going to have negative 30 here. And then again with negative 10, so negative 30 and negative 10 is negative 40. We're moving backwards across the battery terminal or negative in the negative direction. Then in I3, we're moving positive across the battery terminals again, so we get a 30. And finally in I4, in loop four, we're moving across the battery terminals in the negative direction, so we've got 20 and 10 for negative 30. And so we're just gonna plug that into GeoGebra and solve once again. Come up with the row reduced echelon form and we get I1, I2, I3, and I4. I1 is equal to 3.68, and we measure current in amps. I2 is negative 1.9 amps. 
I3 is 2.57 amps. I4 is equal to negative 2.49 amps. And so when Kirchhoff was around, when he came up with the uh, Kirchhoff's law where the sum of all the, the voltages across all the nodes in a circuit uh, are equal or sum together, whatever his law was, not really fundamental to these problems right now, but back in the pre-technology era, uh, people had to solve these problems using both laboratory techniques and mathematical proofs, and they would spend their entire lives, sometimes certainly uh, years, going through loads and loads and loads of uh, similar circuits in order to prove their theorems, in order to uh, come up with reliable measures. Luckily, we can benefit, as Newton and other scientists have said, we can stand on the shoulders of giants today, and we don't have to do all of that tedious empirical check work. We don't have to prove everything. Uh, it's mostly been done for us, so we can go directly to solving, and we can uh, have complete faith in the process because people have spent years and decades and centuries developing these techniques for us, uh, bridging mathematics and science and engineering, and giving us these tools that we can use to build circuits and uh, ultimately create more technology, which makes our lives even more easy, even easier and more efficient, more productive. Uh, but of course, we can't do any of these things if we don't know what the math is for, if we're not math literate, if we don't know which mathematical techniques to use to solve certain problems, if we don't know what these little schematic diagrams are for, uh, if we don't know how to use the technology. And so uh, all of these pieces of the puzzle will help us in our personal and professional lives, uh, but only if we give them the appropriate time and care uh, to learn how to use them. Right, so while talking about something else, I came up with the answers here to solve this second problem, and it really is just as simple as adding up the resistance in each of the loops, right? So six ohms here, and then we've got minus one because it's shared between I1 and I2, and then negative zero and zero there. And so in the second loop, we've got nine 8, 4, 4, and 1 is 9, then they share 1 between 1 and 2, that's a negative because they're going in opposite directions, and so on and so forth through the R matrix there, and then the I matrix is unknown. And finally the V matrix, or the V vector, these are all moving across the battery terminals in a positive direction, so we have all positive numbers here. Plug that into GeoGebra tell the computer to reduce row echelon form and we get the answers voila in a matter of seconds as opposed to uh, just 20 30 years ago uh, which is not a long time in the scope of science and uh, technological advancement but just that long ago this problem could have taken a good 15 20 minutes pretty easily okay Moving along, let's do another one of those. Just another simple circuit with four different loops. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. Sorry, I've got to restart GeoGebra here. Okay, so we're going to set up our matrix using resistance and our unknown current. And so we're just going to do it exactly like we did with the others. We're going to start with I1, 
add up the resistances, we've got 1, 7, and 4 for a total of 12. And then we're sharing one here. So we've got minus 7. We're not touching there. We're sharing one here. So we've got negative 4 and so on uh, through the resistance matrix. And then on the other side of that, we've got the voltages. We're moving positive in I1, we're moving positive in I2, moving negative in I4, and we're moving positive in I3. And so we've got 40 volts in the first one, 30 volts in the second, 20 volts in the third, and negative 10 volts in the fourth. All right, and I've set up the values here, run through the row reduced echelon form which gives us our identity matrix and the solutions to the problem. And we could do these by hand once again, but why do it by hand if we can let the computer do it for us? We can go on and do our other homework or we can uh, work on other parts of the job. This is not quite ex quite the same as learning basic arithmetic. Uh, of course, there is some intuition, as with all mathematical processes, the more precise and the more practice we have doing mathematical processes, especially algebra and uh, basic arithmetic, the more we can apply it in our everyday life. And there is some intuitive value to it where uh, even politicians will talk about political calculus. And I don't think they're really talking about calculus personally, but uh, at at very least, that's recognizing that uh, math is not always transparently involved in all of our lives' functions, but uh, there are certain intuitive processes, and we are, in fact, as we go through the world, we are assessing huge amounts of data, and so uh, and there are a lot of unconscious and subconscious processes where. It, Quite possibly, we are working with matrices at some level uh, and condensing and transforming and working with data and solving problems just on our way to school or as we get up in the morning and think about what we're getting for breakfast or uh, solving any number of daily, daily problems. Uh, however, it might not be entirely important to the average person that they learn how to diagonalize a matrix. And that is completely understandable. And so aside from those specialists who go on to write beautiful computer programs like we have here in GeoGebra uh, that is available for free that will solve these types of problems for us, uh, the average person should at least know that, well, that's a circuit. I mean, there, there's no nothing wrong in having knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And then being able to solve for uh, these values uh, could, in fact, help you most certainly in an engineering field or in uh, even home repair or something like that, various other aspects of professional and personal life where you can rely on uh, a little combination of rudimentary knowledge in mathematics and some technological support to solve what could be relatively complex, complex problems in a fairly streamlined and efficient way. And so finally, we've got budget, budget rent-a-car in uh, Wichita, Kansas has about 500 cars, and so one of the locations, a car rented at one location may be returned to any of the other three locations. The various fractions of cars returned to the three locations are shown in the matrix below. Suppose that on Monday there are 295 cars at the airport or rented from there, 55 cars in the east office, 150 on the west office. What will be the approximate distribution of cars on Wednesday? And so every day we go through this same matrix, and when they're rented for, to the airport, there's a 97% chance that it'll be returned to the airport, so on and so forth. Uh, when they are rented from the airport, 
there's a 0% chance roughly that it'll be returned to the east, about 3% chance that it'll be returned to the west. So that's our first matrix. We're just, we're not even going to uh, do row reduced echelon form here. We're just going to multiply these matrices. Well, we're going to call that one, we're going to call this M1, right? And I've got it here in GeoGebra. M1 is our rented from and returned to matrix. Looks like that. M2 is our Monday, 295 cars at the airport, 55 at the east office, 150 on the west office. And so M3 is just M2 times M1, M2 times M1. And so on Tuesday, this gives us our Tuesday because every day we go through this M1 matrix. M1 times Monday uh, gives us Tuesday. Tuesday, we're going to just round up and round down. 304 plus 57 plus 339, or sorry, 139 is equal to, uh, is equal to 500. And then we're going to multiply M3 by M1 again because that will give us our Tuesday value. And so what we end up with is 311 Tuesday. I'm sorry, Tuesday is equal to 304, 57, and 139. 304 plus 50, 304 plus 57 is 361 plus 139 is 500. And then we're going to multiply that uh, back by our M1 times M1, and we get Wednesday and one times Monday equals Tuesday equals Wednesday. So Wednesday is equal to 312. We're just rounding up because this is an approximation. We can't have half a car, but since uh, it is just an approximation, approximate distribution, then we're just going to round up and round down at 0 0.5. Uh, 58 and 130 gives us a total of 500. And so on Wednesday, we should expect that we'll have 312. That 312 is at the airport. Airport 58 at east and 150 at west. All right, so once again, we see the value of having some knowledge of what matrices do and what they can do. And then when we use our technology, it really expedites the process and gives us more reliable answers. And so uh, linear algebra can become uh, more of a joy than a burden, right? It can become more productive than a time sink with all of the protracted matrix algebra uh, maneuvering that we would have to do. And we don't have to use up pages and pages of paper with matrix, matrix transitions and transpo transposing and inverting and different transforming all of the time. We can just take what we know, put it into our technology and find the answers uh, so that we can solve the problems rather than spending most of our time and energy uh, in the process. Um, though, again, I'm inclined to say that learning the process is still very important. And so while you're out there doing your homework, uh, you've got a couple different ways to come to those solutions, whether you work it out by hand and check the answer on your computer, or whether you work it out on your computer and back, work it back through the, through the process, uh, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, I think we can find that in the working world, then we can uh, use these technologies to our advantage. Okay, thank you.